Okay, so today I want to talk about a really important result about topology called Whitney's theorem. And this is all about when you can embed um, one manifold of a certain number of dimensions into another manifold in a certain number of dimensions. So, um, in some ways, it's a rather um, it's a rather high level and abstract result because it involves thinking about high dimensional manifolds. Um, and as I have been trying to make this course an uh, introductory course. Um, I've been striving to keep everything as simple as possible. And so I'm going to try and give you a flavour of what Whitney's embedding theorem says. So the subject that Whitney's embedding theorem is about is uh, m-dimensional manifolds. So I should tell you what an m-dimensional manifold is. Now, essentially... Um, and by the way, I'm not going to do any of this rigorously. Um, I, I can send you links to um, other sources. I'll put some links up to other sources which explain all of these things rigorously um, with all the extra caveats and details which need to be um, taken care of if one wants to formally use such a result. What I want to do now is just to give you a flavour of what the result says. Okay then. Okay, hello everybody. So today I want to talk about an important result called Whitney's theorem. Now, this is a result about when you can embed one manifold inside another manifold. Um, and so we're going to be talking about some quite high level concepts today. We're going to be talking about m-dimensional space and m-dimensional manifolds. So um, since this is an introductory course, um, there's going to be two things about this explanation. One is I'm not going to be rigorous. Um, I shall put uh, the rigorous um, definitions and things um, in the comments section so that you can find out about them. But in my discussions, I'm going to be quite kind of um, vague in my descriptions of manifolds and so on. Um, so that's one thing. And secondly, I just want to illustrate the results um, in a very kind of basic visual way. I'm not going to give any proofs or anything like that because um, basically my objective is to try and explain these ideas to somebody who doesn't really have any um, sort of back, high level background in mathematics. Okay, So what is an m-dimensional manifold? Well, before we can understand that, we ought to understand what an m-dimensional space is. So, um, I'm talking about real space here and real things. Real meaning to do with the real numbers, okay? So, what's a zero-dimensional space? It is a point, okay? Okay, so what is a one-dimensional space? Well, we can get a one-dimensional space from a zero-dimensional space. Here's how we do it. We take our zero-dimensional space, and um, where it is, and then we sort of shift it along um, in a sort of direction sideways, like this. And we get a one-dimensional space, which is a line. Now, um, you know, true sort of one-dimensional space is an infinitely long line in either direction. But this is just a line segment, and we can get it by taking out a zero-dimensional space and sort of shifting it in a new direction. Um, okay, so this is one-dimensional space. How do we get two-dimensional space? Well, we take our one-dimensional space and we shift it along in a new direction. So, um, there's a as a copy of our one dimensional space. And now if we just shift this along in a new direction which is perpendicular to the previously considered directions, we get a two dimensional space. Okay, so what's three dimensional space? Well to get three dimensional space we take a we take our two dimensional space 
and then we shift it in a direction which is perpendicular to all of the previously considered directions. Excuse my drawing, it's quite difficult to draw when one is not looking at the paper. And then we get the familiar cube, which can essentially be viewed as the thing that you get by taking a square and then shifting it in a direction perpendicular to its plane. Um, okay then, so how do we get four dimensional space? Well, we take a copy of the three dimensional space. And um, then we shift it in a direction perpendicular to all of the previously considered directions. So in our um, in our three-dimensional lives, we wouldn't be able to imagine such a direction, perhaps. But if we assume that there is one, then we can shift our, our cube in that direction. And then we just look at the kind of elongated shape formed... Um, by doing such a shifting. Okay, and so here's a four-dimensional cube, or a, a two-dimensional shadow of a four-dimensional cube, if you like. So um, essentially what we've done here is to take a three-dimensional cube, a piece of 3D space, and then shift it along in a perpendicular direction. So there's another 3D cube right there. Um, and we've kind of looked at the um, space sweeped out um, by doing that, by taking this 3D cube and then shifting it along in some new kind of fourth direction which is perpendicular to horizontal, um, vertical and, uh, and left-right. So um, it's kind of interesting to think about this sort of stuff. Um, some people like to talk about stuff like is it possible to visualise four-dimensional space? Um, I think it is. Um, basically, you can think of time as a fourth dimension, um, because if you imagine a uh, a movie of an of an object, say, um, just watch this. Um, this pen is moving through space, so basically, you can consider a um, a sequence of kind of three D pictures. One where I'm holding the pen here, one where I'm holding the pen here, one where I'm holding the pen here, etc. And um, you can think of each of those as coming after each other, as they would do in a film. Um, and so, in a way, time is sort of like a, a direction which is perpendicular to, um, to the other three dimensions. So, um, okay. Obviously, this um, this idea can be extended further. So one can then consider things like five-dimensional space, six-dimensional space, etc. Okay, so um, that's the basic idea of a of hyperspace, if you like, of um, high-dimensional Euclidean space. Um, Mathematicians tend to explain these things in more conservative terms. They would rather think of um, two-dimensional space as the set of all pairs of numbers. Okay, so in 2D, um, whoops, in 2D you can describe any point by specifying um, by specifying x and y, by specifying how far across it is and how far up it is. Um, and of course, more generally, for example, in 4D space, you can specify a point in this hypercube by saying how, how far to the right do you have to go, how far up do you have to go, how far in do you have to go, and how far in the extra fourth dimension do you have to go to reach that point. So each each point in this hypercube can be specified by um, by four numbers. Um, in general, you can think of um, m-dimensional space as um, the set of all um, 
lists of m numbers, m real numbers. So you know you go this far in that direction, this far in that direction, this far in that direction, etc. Um, so that's high dimensional space, a crash course in hypergeometry. Um, what about manifolds? What's a manifold? Essentially, a manifold is a um, a manifold is a kind of spatial object which has the property that locally it looks like Euclidean space. It looks flat locally. Okay. Um, this isn't a formal definition, of course. Um, in fact, I'm only restricting myself to telling you about very specific kinds of manifolds here. But um, let's start with one-dimensional manifolds. What are the one-dimensional manifolds? Well, the infinitely long line is a 1D manifold. Because imagine if you're a little creature who can walk along this line. Um, wherever you are, if you look around yourself, um, you see it looks like one-dimensional space. Okay? Um, what other kind of manifolds are there? How about a line segment? How about this line segment here, which is, say, um, five centimeters long? Is this a one-dimensional manifold? No, it isn't, because if you're a little 1D creature or something, if you get to here and you look around yourself, it does not look like one-dimensional space locally because you've seen the boundary here. When people um, used to think that the world was flat, they used to imagine that there was a place uh, that you could get to which would be like the end of a world. And um, this idea of the edge of the world or the edge of the universe is a very uh, scary idea to us humans and I'm sure it would be very terrifying to a, a creature who lived in a one manifold as well. So. Uh, who lived on a um, line interval as well. So basically, um, if a surface has an abrupt boundary that can be reached, it's not a manifold, because if a creature gets to such a boundary point, um, the space around them looks different there. They, they see a wall, or they see an end or something. So uh, that stops it being a manifold. So, okay, is the infinite line the only one-dimensional manifold? No. We've also got the circle, okay? So, that's alright. If you're walking around the circle, um, it could be curved, but if you're a, a little one-dimensional creature walking around in a circle, if you look at the, um, at the space close enough to you, um, it looks flat. So, that makes it a one-dimensional manifold. Okay, then. So, that's 1D. Now let's quickly move up to two-dimensional manifolds. Um, so what's an example of a 2D manifold? A ball. A ball is an example. Um, the, uh, the infinite 2D plane is a 2D manifold. A sphere is a 2D manifold. Um, I'll give you another example. which is the torus, okay? So if we take a piece of paper and we glue the top to the bottom and we glue to the left to the right, we get this kind of donut shape, okay? This is a torus. Um, an alternative way to think of it, excuse me, um, is that we can think of it as a, as a kind of square or rectangle with opposite edges identified. So. If you um, are a little 2D creature, if you walk off this boundary, you end up coming back on this boundary. And if you walk off this boundary, you end up coming back on this boundary. So this is a two-dimensional manifold, because um, wherever you are, if you sort of um, take a point and you look at the sort of neighborhood around that point, it looks like two-dimensional space if you, if you pick a small enough um, radius. So that makes it a two-dimensional manifold. Um, so the sphere, the torus, the plane, are these the only two-dimensional manifolds? No, there's, there's lots of them. Basically, any surface 
um, without a kind of abrupt boundary is a two-dimensional manifold. Um, but let me show you a more interesting one. Um, if we get this model here, um, and then we change it a bit, so let's now point this arrow upwards instead of downwards. Okay, so you see what I've done here, I had an arrow, but both of these arrows used to point down, now I'm pointing this arrow up. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that this shape now has a twist in it, so that a creature that walks off in this direction now comes on in this direction. This is called a climb bottle. Okay. So what I've essentially done here is um, glued the top to the bottom, and I've also glued the left to the right, but with a twist. A little bit like um, if you make a Mobius strip. So when you make a Mobius strip, um, you give it half a twist before you glue the left to the right, like this. Okay. So then, um, if you go off, if you go off the Mobius strip at the top here, you end up sort of coming back on on the other side at the bottom here. So this is called a climb bottle, okay? And it's another example of a manifold. You can see uh, other videos about climb bottles. You, you might even know what they are. Um, okay, so what does this have to do with Whitney's theorem? Well. What does Whitney's theorem say? Whitney's theorem says that every m-dimensional manifold can be embedded um, in 2m-dimensional space. Now I'm missing out a lot of the details which you can see in the comments below if you want the full uh, extensive theorem but I'm trying to give you the basic idea of what it says. So basically it says that you can embed every n-dimensional manifold in two n-dimensional space. So what does that mean? Well, okay, firstly let's just talk a little bit more about manifolds. You've seen two-dimensional manifolds, one-dimensional manifolds. You can also have three-dimensional manifolds. An example would be three-dimensional space. There's also a three-dimensional analog of a sphere, which is basically kind of similar to the uh, hypercube that I just drew for you. Um, there are also many other kinds of three-dimensional manifolds. For example, there's like a hypertorus, which is like, you basically think of it as like a cube with opposite faces identified. So that if you were a creature living inside this cube, um, if you walked out of one face, you end up coming in through the other face, etc. Um, so a three-dimensional manifold basically is some kind of spatial thing um, where if you take any point and you just look at a small sphere around that point, you just look at the neighbourhood of that point, the kind of uh, 3D sphere around that point, it all looks flat and it looks like 3D Euclidean space. Okay, so um, you can then imagine higher and higher order manifolds. Uh, basically, an m dimensional manifold is where if you take any point and you look at a small enough neighborhood around that point, it looks like m dimensional space. Okay, flat space. Now, then, what does Whitney's theorem say? Whitney's theorem says that any m dimensional manifold can be embedded in 2m dimensional space. So let's look at some examples. The circle is a one dimensional manifold and I've just embedded it in two dimensional space, you see? So um, this is an example of uh, Whitney's theorem. Um, now the sphere is a two dimensional manifold and obviously that can be embedded in three-dimensional space. Uh, we see it all the time. We see a ball uh, in the air. That's a sphere which has been embedded in 3D space. Okay. Um, so in general, uh, Whitney's theorem says that, for example, every two-dimensional manifold can be embedded in 
um, space of dimension 4 or less. Well, that seems a bit strange, doesn't it? Why, surely every surface can be embedded in 3D space, right? Not really. Not with the kind of embeddings that we have in mind, because we're not going to allow certain things to happen. For example, we're not going to allow self-intersection, okay? So, let me give you an example. This uh, Klein bottle here, okay? So, the Klein bottle um, is basically, to make a Klein bottle, you take a rectangle and you glue the top to the bottom, okay? And you also give this thing half a twist and then you glue the left hand side to the right hand side, a bit like the way you make a Mobius strip. So, the Klein bottle is often called the Twisted Taurus. Um, another way to think of it is, um, well, I'll show you a picture of a, um, of a Taurus, of, sorry, of a Klein bottle, and you can see um, the usual way to illustrate it in 3D. Now, there's something very important about the Klein bottle, and that is that you cannot actually embed it properly in 3D space. However you try, you're going to get self-intersection. This Klein bottle, this funny twisted sphere thing, sorry, this funny twisted torus thing, um, actually cannot be embedded in 3D space without having some parts of the surface crossing through themselves. And so um, here we have, have an example of a 2D manifold that cannot be embedded in 3D space. But Whitney's theorem says that it can be embedded in 4D space without self-intersections. And Whitney's theorem goes further. And in general, Whitney's theorem says that every m-dimensional manifold can be embedded in 2m-dimensional two di two space. Um, so there you go. Um, you can see the details below um, if you want to know more about this. Thank you. Here we have an example of a Klein bottle, which I 3D printed uh, this evening. Um, and you can see that it's, um, it's self-intersecting. Basically, the idea is that... Let me get a good focus on it. Yes, the idea is that um, this kind of tube goes up and then it has to intersect itself so that it can come back down and join itself.